Uh, well, I would uh, now like to call upon Justice Oshim Banerjee, Chairperson WBCERC, for his short speech. Good afternoon. Very warm good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I think uh, the people are yet to be back after lunch. There is a long queue. Time is also short. First, my unqualified apology for not being here at the beginning of the session because I was traveling to uh, Calcutta from Malda after doing this, this job. Yesterday, I had the almost similar line of discussion at Malda and uh, day after, uh, day before also, two day session. Today's topic is absolutely a technical issue and I am the person odd man out. My only request to you, why not, when you are treating a patient, kindly take two things into consideration, particularly in ICU, because this high-end antibiotic drugs you are using at ICU, whether you are prolonging the death or you are prolonging the life. And in whichever way you decide, please explain to the patient family how crude it may be, but they must know the reality. Because at the end of the day, let it not be that they lose the patient and the, their means of livelihood. Everything gone. In ICU, as, we, uh, as I gather from all of you, I was listening for quite some time. When a patient is critically ill, you Empirically, you prescribe broad-spectrum antibiotic waiting for the sensor sensitivity report. And after the, that particular, and wait for at least the required uh, course for five days, and then you find that the medicine is not working, then you switch over to the other, or that by that time your cultural report comes. By this time, the, prolong, uh, the stay at ICU is prolonged. As Dr. Todi was telling, that if one day is saved, that would save a lot of money. Sir, science is advancing like in jet speed. I am told by Dr. Tanmay Banerjee, Medica has brought the machine. This culture taste may be a costly one. It can give report within minutes or within hours compared to the conservative procedure followed, waiting for a few days to get the report. It might be when conservative test would cost X your, and the new one would cost X uh, multiplied by 4, the amount which would come and if you compare it with the prolongation of the stay at the ICU and explain it to the patient family, I am sure they would go for it. So sir, Whenever you decide you, you are treating a patient, obviously you would be experimenting drug because at the end of the day your aim is to save the patient. But at the same time, kindly keep it in mind that the patient would require an affordable ICU care, not beyond imagination. Sir, I wish success for this session and I must congratulate Dr. Tanmay Banerjee and Dr. Prabhuddha Mukherjee, their relentless effort for this 
two day uh, conference today we are holding conference with the medical experts working in the field of nabl hospi- accredited hospitals and hospitals having more than 100 beds tomorrow we would be uh, we would be discussing uh, the issues the same issue with the hospitals who uh, the who is uh, who are having the patients who cannot afford this kind of cost of treatment so i wish success for this program this is an ongoing process we are doing this workshop series we have started from tata medical center with front desk management then followed by admission discharge critical care me- uh, me- mechanism infection control mechanism i was requesting dr todi why not you sponsor your hospital would sponsor the next workshop affordable icu and there is one more topic it is alarming and it is really alarming government is also concerned about that and we are also uh, agreeing to that that is maternal death for that we are planning to have workshop we would definitely come back to you uh, with our next program it as i say it is an ongoing process during covid we get lot of support from you and we can today proudly say that we are the best in the country in the matter of covid treatment and the entire credit goes to you so sir at the end of the day think of the patient and their pocket thank you thank you all thank you sir i would now like to call upon dr kunal sarkar to felicitate justice banerji with a small token of appreciation Thank you, sirs. We continue with the next session for the day on antibiotic pres- prescription in OPD by Professor Dr. Bibhuti Shaha. Professor Dr. Shaha is head Department of Infectious Diseases and Advanced Microbiology at Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine. Sir, request you to be on the podium, please. So, uh, I'm thankful to uh, CRC and uh, Medical Super Speciality and uh, Ramakrishna Mission Shiva Position and Hospital to ask me to talk on this topic. Uh, let me first confess that I prepared my talk for the first line as not for the expert. So this is basically aimed at people who are treating patients and the OPDs. And if you look at the problem of this uh, antibiotic resistance, I think the first thing starts in the OPD prescription. So I think we should also stress upon the charity should begin at home. <clears throat> so this is, and I'll be very brief because I understand we're running very late. So I'll, I'll be quickly going through uh, my presentation. This is how I have planned for this. Um, right. So my f- I start with my first patient, 28-year-old man from Goria has come for history of fever for three days. Headache and body ache is there. There's no cough, dysuria frequency. Uh, also, there is slight constipation and there is no past history of significant illness. So, uh, can someone from the audience briefly uh, tell me what are the possibilities we should consider? I understand there are residents here, so would you like to, someone like to comment on what can be the possibilities? Any taker? Fever for three days, body ache, headache, constipation. So, this is the history. Okay, I think no one is attempting. So these are the differentials with considered malaria, dengue, typhoid, any other things. Now my question is, does it need an antibiotic? Will you prescribe an antibiotic? You will not prescribe. Okay, that's good. So, but we have seen that people with presenting with three days of fever, they call a doctor 
or goes to a shop, even calls a doctor and he has been prescribed azithromycin, cefixim, so on and so forth. So this is the practice which you are doing. So you must understand that uh, we need to consider what are the chances this patient has a bacterial infection. Is my clinical examination going to help my decision? Do we need investigations at this point in time? Basic investigation, but clowns, malaria, dengue. Uh, will someone will look for uh, typhoid, uh, IgM antibody, cultures, etc. Second patient. A 68 year old patient from Bararazar has come to the OPD with a history of fever for four days, high grade, subsiding with paracetamol to reappear after six to eight hours. He also has headache and body ache. He has a cough which is non productive. There is no complaint regarding the urination. He has not passed stool for two days. And he's a diabetic and hypertensive on medications. Tell me certain amlodipine, cetagliptine, metformin, atovastatin, so on and so forth. So, does this patient need an antibiotic? He does. Raja says he does. Uh, uh, anyone in the uh, background, I think there are many residents there. So, it's my talk is mainly intended for you. Do, does he need an antibiotic? What will be your answer? Sarah said he does. Will anyone of, among you like to comment on this? Will you straight away go for antibiotic therapy or you'll assess the patient for uh, to a certain extent? Yeah. You'll assess. What assessment you'll do? Do you have a mic? Do you have a mic? Can anyone help her with the mic? Do you have a mic? Okay, please, you, you, can, you are audible. What assessment do you like to do? Because this is the, uh, my, my, my target is you people, but I just want to address these issues, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you like some test to do. What test you like to do? Like say, um, uh, patient is uh, suffering from fever. Mm -hmm. So uh, CBC, mm -hmm. and then uh, malaria, mm -hmm. dengue, mm -hmm. um, then uh, are there common tests we will do? What common test? Please, be, you are very right. Please, any other test you like to do? Would you like to do a chest X-ray? Of course, sir. Would you like to send any culture? Uh, is non-productive cup, so he's not producing yes. sputum. Uh, so we will not send sputum as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure, sir. So basically we need to think about the patient and we need to know, understand is, is, if it is an infection. So we need to do a risk assessment. Can there be any non-infectious mimic? And we need to send appropriate cultures before the final diagnosis. So if you go look at the ICMR guideline, there is a recent ICMR guideline I request. I think all of you has that and you can, you can have it on the uh, mobile phone also, app is there. So they are suggesting to limit empiric antibiotic therapy to genuinely seriously ill patients only for select group of patients after sending appropriate cultures. And what are those patients? Febrile neutropenia, severe sepsis and septic shock, community acquired pneumonia, ventilator associated pneumonia and necrotizing fasciitis. So these are the conditions where you, after taking the antibiotics, after taking the appropriate cultures, you send an, uh, start an antibiotics empirically. So you need to identify the syndrome, what is the source, what is the possible microbial pathogen, and you need to know the local resistance pattern depending on the institutional antibiogram. I, need, I don't know whether how many institutes have that. You don't use antibiotics in viral pharyngitis, rhinosinusitis, bronchitis, or there may be non-infectious cardiopulmonary syndromes, heart failure presenting with cough. So you don't use antibiotics for that. And you need to choose the antibiotics depending on the spectrum, dose, route, duration, and it has to have a right tissue uh, penetration. Dr. Tori was mentioning that in his during his presentation. How long do you give antibiotics? That's again important. For community acquired pneumonia, five days, hospital acquired pneumonia, eight days, skin and soft tissue infections for five days, UTIs, if it is cystitis, three to five days, pyelonephritis, five to 14 days, catheter associated is seven days, and intraabdominal infection for four to seven days. Uh, there are uh, recommendations, I think you have that in the app, so I am not going to this, what antibiotics you use in what situations, uh, because I am trying to limit my time, just to discuss the issues. So. Someone may be suffering from, my wife is coughing for last five, six days uh, and I, I didn't give her any antibiotics, she's coughing. So you need to think about whether it's a bacterial or viral 
And uh, even if the renin but even if the sputum is purulent, you may not give an antibiotic. Treat symptomatically. And if the cough is more than 14 days, then you think about pertussis and TB. And you treat for, with macrolides. And if you still persist, work for tuberculosis. Etiology of KFs, we know bacteria, viruses, pneumonia, atypical organisms, tropical pathogens, all of them can cause community acquired pneumonia. We need to risk stratify them by the CARB 65 or CRB 65. I think you know about them. How to triage them? Uh, I'm not repeating the CARB 65 criteria. I understand all of you know this, but you need to assess them to decide on whether you treat them as outpatient or you admit them. So if the score is 0 to 1, OPD treatment, 2, admit in the ward, more than 3, admit in the ICU. Uh, these are the recommendations for antibiotic treatment. You have again that, you are all are using this, so they have that in the app, so you can uh, know this. Just keep the selected areas where you need to give more stress. Risk conditions, whether they are any, whether the patient has a risk for uh, pseudomonas infection, you have to think about all them. them. My third patient, a lady, aged 28 years, in the 11 weeks of pregnancy, has come with a history of dysuria and frequency for last three days. She feels feverishness. She is not diabetic, not on regular medicines. Do we prescribe antibiotics for her? Do we prescribe antibiotics to this lady? She is a pregnant lady, first trimester of pregnancy. So, What does the house say? Yes or no? No. Okay. So, we need to, we know the UTI syndromes. There may be asymptomatic bacteria, you are getting bacteria in the urine, but there is no symptoms, don't treat. Acute cystitis is like the symptom this pregnant lady is having, this urea frequency urgency without fever or chills. So, you can have that in urethritis also. And when you have flank pain or tenderness, then you tell that this is acute pyelonephritis. This means infection has reached the kidney. And complicated UTI means there is some structural defect in the urinary tract. So ideally, you should send urine microscopy. If you have leukocyte stress test facility, you can do that, send the cultures. And for this lady, because we are not suspecting pyelonephritis or complicated UTI, so we are not going to send blood culture or we are not going to do USG, KUB or CCD, KUB. But if that on those specific situations, and you can give empirical treatment. But since she is a pregnant lady and the symptoms are suggesting cystitis or maybe urethritis also, ideally we should send a urine culture and start her on antibiotic because the first time is for pregnancy. And one thing you see in the recommendation, the first drug of choice by ICMR is nitrofurantan or phosphomycin. But there is a caveat. Phosphomycin should be avoided when there is a suspicion of pyelonephritis, number one. And phosphomycin should be restricted for gram negative MDR organisms. Please remember this don't use phosphomycin for any ordinary UTI. We need to keep the reserve, otherwise, we are going to lose this drug also. So you know that first safe uh, uh, antibiotics safe in the first trimester amoxicillin, ampicillin, cephalosporin, nitrofurantan, trimethoprim. We are not using going to use fluoroquinolones in the first trimester. A 42 year old man has come to my OPD with painful red swelling of the right leg for five days. So you know these conditions. One is pharyngosis. You can see the picture. There is a deep seated infection of the hair follicle. There can be carbuncle. Well, multiple. Uh, conglomerated lesions are there. You know edisipelas, rapidly spreading painful uh, red condition. Cellulitis is very common where it is rapidly spreading and no definite borders. And very deadly condition, necrotizing fasciitis, which is a very deadly condition. You need to recognize, start treatment very early and give good debridement. This is very serious condition. So treatment, we know abscesses, you can use all the usual antibiotics. I'm again not going to detail of the antibiotic use. You have that in the app, you know. For necrotizing fasciitis, surgery. So antibiotics and surgery is very important. And antibiotic has to be given for at least 14 days. Good surgery has to be there. Otherwise, the person is going to lose the limb. Uh, last patient, young boy has presented with pain, abdomen, loose motion for the last 36 hours. Do we give an antibiotic? Very common problem. People come to us, us. Pain abdomen, frequent loose motion, 36 hours. The first thing we give to the patient is ORS, of course. Do we give an antibiotic? 
okay so you know what is the idea acute diarrhea means less than 14 days persistent is more than 14 days to less than 30 days and chronic diarrhea is more than 13 days we are dealing with a patient with acute diarrhea so the common causes are if it is watery diarrhea it's e coli is common or if it's epidemic vibrio cholerae deadly cholera you know cholera does occur in kolkata we had cholera in kolkata few years ago also and there can be seasonal viral outbreaks also bacteria can be there and if it's a acute bloody diarrhea most common is shigella and also others can be campylobacter varieties of e coli salmonella entamoeba etc so for common diarrhea we don't usually do any test because most of them are self limiting but you can do a routine microscopy where present of fecal leukocytes will suggest invasive bacterial infection if you get entamoeba histopozoites inside rbcs then it's a amoebic dysentery and if you get cyst of tropozoites without rbc that may be colonizer also so when do you send i find the stool culture being sent for diarrhea patients routinely we don't send culture blood stool unless there is a gross bloody stool severe dehydration signs of inflammatory disease and symptoms lasting more than 3 to 7 days and the person is immunocompromised then you send the stool culture uh, Antimicrobials for acute diarrhea, watery diarrhea, usually not typically integrated unless there is an outbreak situation. Some of us are using prebiotics or probiotics, they are not recommended unless it is a post antibiotic associated diarrhea. Loperamide can be used only for travelers diarrhea where it will give symptomatic relief. Bloody diarrhea, well, Shigella is the most common uh, cause, so you must be using some antibiotics which reduce the duration of the diarrhea and the fever. So, we have to use an antibiotic for bloody diarrhea. Vibrio cholerae, the treatment we know, a single dose of doxycycline or erythromycin 1 gram. For Shigella, I use ciprofloxacin 500 milligram BD for 3 days. And IBS is metronidazole and GRDS is also metronidazole. So, these are the recommendations. But we must remember that most of the watery diarrhea are self limiting, only taking care of the dehydration is important. So, I'll conclude by saying that. Uh, we must be very careful when we are seeing the patients in the OPD because what we prescribe for the patients is going to tell about its future. This same patient may land up with ICU with a resistant bug unless I use a proper justified treatment. So we have to be very careful. We need to identify the underlying risk conditions, whether the patient is taking any drugs or not. And uh, we have guidelines. You can download the, uh, I think you have that. Otherwise, you can download the ICMR app in your mobile phone and that guides to help you and of course hospitals may be having uh, antibiotic policies and this sort of CME is very important at all levels so that we prescribe properly to, 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 to help our people and also help ourselves. So I bring greetings and thanks for my institution. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you sir. I would now like to call upon Dr. Raja Dhor to felicitate Dr. Shaha with a small token of appreciation, please. Thank you, sirs. I would now like to call upon Dr. Bhaskar Narayan Choudhury, our next speaker of the day on stage. Dr. Choudhury is the Chief Microbiologist and Senior Consultant, Department of Microbiology and Molecular Biology and Infection Control Officer, Peerless Hospitex Hospital and Research Center Limited. Sir will be speaking on current trends of drug resistance and infection in a Kolkata hospital. Sir, request you to be on stage, please. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much, uh, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity to speak. And I have to rush through my talk because we are much behind schedule, and we have the last, uh, the most attractive session will be the panel discussion. So before that, I will... Uh, I will go through a statistical data from my hospital, from PLS Hospital, regarding the 
antimicrobial resistance pattern in a uh, private hospital of Kolkata. And I have divided uh, the statistical data into three uh, actually categories. One is the 2019 data, which we can tell that it is the pre-COVID era. 2021, 2020, due to the COVID pandemic, it was just we, we didn't get much cultures also, and uh, we, I couldn't uh, formulate a total antibiogram for 2020 because of obvious reasons. And 2021, we, which was the second year of COVID, and 2022, we can say that it's post-COVID, almost post-COVID, although we had the third wave in January, and again in June, there was some upsurge of cases. So you all know that misuse of antibiotics puts all of us at risk, and the COVID pandemic may be over or in the verge, on the verge of uh, being uh, declining, but the AMR pandemic is raging for nearly a century now, since the uh, discovery of penicillin nearly 100 years back, the AMR pandemic has started all over the world and it's still continuing. So in our hospital, you can see that in the pre-COVID, uh, uh, there is not much difference, only the fungal infections went up during the COVID period. So the percentage of fungal isolates were more during the COVID period uh, compared to the others. Otherwise, we are getting lots of gram-negative isolates, may nearly 80 to 81 percent are gram-negatives and others are gram-positives. And amongst the gram negatives, uh, in the pre-COVID era, we found that E. coli and Klebsiella, we are the commonest organisms. But in the COVID era, the E. coli organisms dropped, uh, the Klebsiella organisms almost remained intact. And we had the other organisms like Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, and the fungal, uh, the, these were increased slightly. And now, again, E. coli is the commonest organism in 2022. So amongst the gram positives, again, Enterococcus, 36% uh, in pre-COVID, increased to 47%, particularly Fischium, increased a lot during the COVID era. And now it has come down to 40%. And coagulase negative Staphylococci remained almost similar. Staph aureus went down during the, the obvious uh, Staph aureus. We got less isolates during the COVID era compared to the pre-COVID era. Fungal isolates, again, there was a rise in fungal isolates isolated during the COVID period, and we had more of non-albicans candida. Uh, uh, even now, we are having non-albicans more than albicans, so that is the scenario. And out of the tribes of prevalent infection, what is the interesting fact that I have found over the last three years? Whenever there is a COVID wave, the number of bloodstream infections when goes up. It may be due to various reasons, uh, due to uh, non-adherence to infection, proper infection cultural practices, or the uh, CLAPSI bundle is not being followed, particularly in the COVID words. Uh, so the bloodstream infection shot up from 26% in 2019 to 37% in 2021, and in 2022, in 29%, uh, but during the third wave and during even in June 2022, when we had upsurge of cases, we had lots of bloodstream infections. Uh, otherwise, urinary tract infection is the next common, and then we have uh, the respiratory tract infections also. So now coming to the individual organisms, Klebsiella is the most notorious uh, uh, multidrug resistant organism that we face in all our practice, so I am focusing on the carbapenem resistance Klebsiella. It was 64 to 66%, around 65% of the Klebsiella isolates are carbapenem resistant. Carbapenem resistant uh, varies from 1% one, uh, one to 4%. It was high in 2019, but subsequently came down due to proper infection control measures probably. And pandrug resistant uh, Klebsiella, we are isolating around one or two per year two to three isolates per year. ESBL, on the other hand, is very low amongst the Klebsiella, AMC, and co-producers are also low. Compared to that, in uh, E. coli, we are still fortunate to have a low carbapenem resistance, around 16 to 17% of the E. coli isolates are carbapenem resistant. We haven't found any pandrug resistant or polymyxin resistant E. coli isolate. ESBL uh, is, uh, production is high amongst the uh, e. coli, it ranges from 40 to 57 percent. The other enterobacteria, we have found many pandrug resistant providentia and some pandrug resistant enterobacter isolates also. 
Polymixin resistance is also high. Uh, the proteus group of organisms are intrinsically resistant to polymyxin, so these are the other organisms, polymyxin resistant enterobacter we are finding, other than Klebsiella also. The percentage of CRE is slowly increasing over the years, carbapenem resistant other enterobacteriaceae. ESBL and AMC are more or less similar. Pseudomonas, carbapenem resistance around 43 to 49% over the years. And uh, fortunately, the pseudomonas carbapenem resistance, it was uh, higher earlier in 2018, 2016 or earlier, but it has slightly come down. Polymixin resistance went up during the COVID era. In 2021, we had 13% of pseudomonas which were polymixin resistant and 11% of pseudomonas which are pan drug resistant. Fortunately, the uh, percentage has come down in the post COVID era. Acinetobacter, on the other hand, we haven't found any polymyxin resistance or pandrug resistance in acinetobacter over the last three or four years, but the carbapenem resistance is very high, more than 85%. Now coming to Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus, although the number is less, we're finding the uh, MRSA, that is methicillin resistance staph for years, it's not that uncommon. During the COVID era, there was a jump to 36%, otherwise it was 22% in 2019 and 32% uh, in 2022, okay. And out of these, the majority are MEK-A producing uh, staph aureus. MEK-C is very rare amongst the MRSA that we are isolating. Coagulase negative Staphylococcus, on the other hand, the incidence of methicillin resistance is very high in the order of 60 to 80 percent. And during the COVID era, we had lots of coagulase negative Staphylococcus causing bloodstream infections and majority of them were methicillin resistance. So the methicillin resistance coagulase negative staph during the, in 2021, it was in the order of 83 percent. Now, enterococcus, uh, we are getting around 40%, uh, 40, 40 to 50% are enterococcus fecalis and others more, we are getting enterococcus fischium. Again, during the COVID times, we had an incidence of more an incidence of enterococcus fischium and more incidence of VRE. VRE went up to 20% uh, in 2021 and in 2022, it has slightly come down to 19%. In 2019, it was 11%. And penicillin resistant pneumococci, the number of pneumococcal isolates went down during the COVID times, but penicillin resistance is slowly increasing from 17% in 2019 to 25% in 2022. Candida, as I have already told you, during the COVID times, we had almost the uh, one and a half times more incidence of candida isolates. And most of them we are non-albicans, around 70 to 70% 70 of them we are non-albicans candida. And fluconazole resistance and other resistance we are, also, uh, are also found in candida because mostly we are getting uh, candida tropicalis is the commonest amongst the non-albicans, but second to that we are getting candida oris, which is in resistant to many of the found resistance to fluconazole and even amphotericin B. And also we are getting candida glabrata and other candida isolates. So now coming to the molecular detection of AMR genes, this is very important because uh, now we are getting uh, cholestine polymyxin B as per latest CLSI guidelines, they are only intermediate. There is no sensitive uh, breakpoints for these polymyxins. So we are left, uh, even if we, the, we are, uh, the, those are given, they have to be given in combination. But we are getting so much of carbapenem resistance and amongst the carbapenem resistance, there is the commonest is NDM as we all know. But if it is NDM, the next drug we are uh, considering is ceftazidim avibactam, which doesn't work against NDM, okay? You have to give astrionum in combination with ceftazidim avibactam because astrionum uh, avibactam combination is not yet available, okay? But if it is OXA48 or KPC, then you can give ceftazidim avibactam alone. So it's very important to get what carbapenem is uh, the organism is producing. For that reason, in PLS Hospital, we have started since uh, August 2022, all the inpatient isolates, gram-negative and gram-positive Staphylococca and Trococcus isolates, those are being subjected to PCR, which gives the result the same day. 
Instead of the closed PCR by GeneXpert, which is very expensive, we are using open PCR because during the COVID times, all of our labs are equipped with uh, PCR analyzers now. So this open PCR is much less expensive and also we can give the report within the same day evening so that the empirical treatment can be started because you see that there are no antibiotics in the pipeline which will cover all the gram-negative isolates, the resistant gram-negative isolates. The most promising is cefidirocol, but it's a long time to come into India. So the molecular data of PLS hospital, this is six months data I have seen. So I, I'm presenting here the total inpatient isolates processed for multiplex uh, real-time PCR by open system that was 913 out of this. Around 827 were gram-negative isolates and including mainly the Enterobacteriaceae, Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. And gram-positive cocci that were processed were 86, out of which 45 were Staphylococcus and 41 were Enterococcus. And out of the Staphylococcus, 36 were Staph aureus and others were coagulous negative Staphylococcus. So this is the data. Uh, unlike the uh, notion that most of our isolates are NDM producers, the carbap NMSs, uh, NDM is in fact the highest, so around 50% of the, uh, that is 394 of the, uh, that is 47.6% out of the 827 gram negative isolates, we are carbap NM resistant and they were producing carbap NMSs of which 50% were NDM alone. Around 23% were both NDM and OXA48, and 19% were OXA48 alone. Followed by that, we are VIM, that is another metallobetalactamase, uh, KPC, and the others are very small in uh, numbers. So KPC is not much of a problem in our country, but we have a load of OXA48 as well as NDM. NDM still happens to be the commonest carbap NMS that is produced by the Enterobacteriaceae. And here we have to give ceftazidim avibactam in combination with astronum, or we have to give some alternative therapy. And this data we are providing on the first day itself, when they're from the isolate, in the evening we are giving the data so that they can de-escalate accordingly or uh, adjust the therapy accordingly. Amongst the staphylococcal isolates uh, that we have processed, 45 isolates of, with, of them, 20, that is 44%, we are uh, MRSA. Uh, sorry, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus. Of these 36, we are Staph aureus, of, of which 33% we are uh, methicillin resistant, and all of these were make A genes. So, make C we haven't found in uh, any of the isolates so far. Coagulase negative Staphylococci, 89% we are uh, methicillin resistant. Okay, 8 out of 9 isolates, only one was found to be methicillin sensitive. And this is the Enterococcus isolates. 18, uh, that is 44% out of 41 isolates were found to be VRD, that is vancomycin resistant. And out of the vancomycin resistance, 5, that is 28%, we are VAN A. 2, that is 11%, we are VAN B alone. And 11, that is 61%, we are producing both VAN A and VAN B. So amongst the VRD, we are having uh, Enterococcus, which are pr producing both VAN A and VAN V. They are having both VAN A and VAN V. Okay, so this is the data that I am presenting. I have presented here. Our time with antibiotics is running out, and probably we are uh, now quickly moving towards the post-antibiotic era. But there is some uh, uh, development in our state. Our uh, in our state, an antimicrobial stewardship committee has been formed. And they have, I can't uh, present the government data over here because uh, I am a part of that expert committee that has been formed by the state government. But they have gathered data from the medical colleges. So around four or five months data have been uh, compiled. And the data is very much similar to the private hospital. But I can't present that data here. I think it will be presented in a different platform, on a different platform. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we can have the panel discussion now. Yes. 
actually candida oris if it is found in urine uh, we are not treating we are not advocating in bloodstream we have found and some of the patients have died also i don't have that mortality data but many of the patients uh, succumbed but ultimately, most of the patients were uh, treated with echinocandines only, and uh, some of them responded, definitely. Drug resistant, I haven't present because I'm not finding much uh, uh, drug resistant salmonella type in our days. Earlier, during 2016-17, I got ESBL salmonella, but not more than that. ESBL or MC producing salmonella. But now the isolates that are coming, even one isolate I've got today, these are pan-sensitive. All of them are sensitive to third generation cephalosporin. So ceftriaxone uh, is being given for these patients. formulate an uh, antibiotic policy based on this data, sir? Yes, we have an antibiotic policy. And that anti -poli antibiotic policy is dynamic. It's changed every year, depending on the antibiogram. Okay. So that uh, antibiotic policy is formulated in the government hospitals also nowadays. <laughs> Yes. Empirical, uh, say, I cannot say that ceftazidim avibactam will be an empirical choice because it's a new antibiotic and it should be reserved for patients. But sometimes in very severe infection, patient landing them in ICU, uh, we are not sure what is that. Although we are giving the report, uh, we have the uh, biofire also, that is, uh, we are detecting the organisms and the resistance pattern also very quickly nowadays. So, uh, in those situations, we, we have no other choice but to start the patient on ceftazidim avivactam with astrionum. That is the broadest spectrum that is available, if it is gram-negative sepsis. Then we de-escalate after getting the, uh, at least the PCR reports. Do you have any antibiotic Yes, yes, we are doing regularly. <laughs> so, I think the worst thing that you can do is to actually, if you have a lot of NDM in your ICU, the worst thing you can do is actually to formulate an antibiotic policy which is beyond the NDMs because then you'll also get resistant bugs. So your policy would be to find out why you're getting such a lot of NDMs and try and preserve antibiotics with your antibiogram rather than trying to overcome the NDM bugs by prescribing an astronym or an ivibactam for instance in all patients. Yeah. You know, Varshkar, I think what we require is a smarter antibiograms in the sense that antibiograms are produced by all the isolates that you get in the lab and what is the sensitivity. But what we need in the hospital is an OPD-based antibiogram, ward-based antibiogram, ICU-based antibiogram. There are different bugs with different sensitivity. So somebody in a uh, ward with a pneumonia will have a different spectrum. Yes. That is first. Second is we don't have an antibiogram which is time specific. I'm sure anyone who is in ICU for five to seven days, within seven days, is unlikely to get a very bad NDM only bug. After seven days, it starts increasing. So I would like to know from microbiologists what is the antibiogram for seven days in the ICU and post seven days. And lastly, infection based antibiogram. Those isolates that you have in your lab, many of them could be colonizer. Yes. They are not infection. So mm. I would like to know what are the bugs causing pneumonia, causing UTI, causing bacteremia in my hospital, and what is their spectrum? So if I get a pneumonia, then I know, look, these are the bugs which cause pneumonia, rather than the isolates that you have so I think that kind of thinking for newer antibiogram would help the clinicians. 
No, actually, we have prepared our antibiogram. We have uh, classified the infections into type 1, type 2, and type 3 infections. Type 1 is community acquired, type 2 is uh, healthcare associated, and type 3 is nosocomial. So, our antibiograms that are, uh, are prepared based on the data, non ICU data as well as intensive care data, it's separated. And in the antibiograms, we take only the isolates which are uh, considered to be pathogenic, not colonizers. So we have a colonization rate of around 20 to 25 percent. So that colonizers are not taken into the antibiogram. Okay, we don't report it also. But uh, sometimes we are reporting uh, colonizers also with a comment because say an ET aspirate will grow something. Mm. Most of the cases grows an acinobacter or, e uh, uh, or an uh, Klebsiella. Okay, but uh, looking, uh, these are purulent also, but the colony count is low. So it, it's, it's more like a tracheobronchitis or coloni uh, colonizer. Okay, so clinically they have to think uh, whether they will start antibiotics or not. We have regular discussion with the clinicians and we give rounds also. So in mo most of the cases, uh, antibiotics are not needed for this because they are found out to be colonizers. So antibiogram is basically prepared uh, based on the pathogenic organisms and for type 1 infections we are following the guidelines that are already there for community acquired pneumonia, community acquired urinary tract infection. So that is also incorporated in our antibiotic policy. For healthcare associated infection there is a separate policy and for nosocomial infection there is a separate policy and it is divided as per, as per the different infections say for urinary tract infection, bloodstream infection. Uh, respiratory infection like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we have to start the panel discussion. Raja, Raja is getting late. Raja and Shubham got that. Uh, thank you, sir, for your talk. I would now like to call upon Dr. Shubham Choudhury to felicitate Dr. Choudhury with a small token of appreciation, please. Thank you, sir. 